What's up, everybody? Harrison Van Riper here, back with another episode of Shadow Talk. This is our year-end edition, and joining me this week is some very special guests uh, all throughout the Photon team. Uh, joining me on in the studio, actually, is Alex. Alex G., how are you? Good. We have a full house today, huh? We do, we do have a full house. Well, not in not in-house, but around the world. <laughs> um, yeah. On the line is uh, is Victoria Austin in London. Victoria, how are you? I'm well, very well, thanks, guys. How are you? Pretty good, pretty good. And then we also have Rick Holland, our CISO, who spared time out of his busy, busy schedule to talk with us this week. How are you, Rick? Good. I'm glad to be back for my twice-a-year visit. <laughs> it really should be more than that. You were, you were going to come into the office, but your check engine light came on. That's right. Are you getting it solved? You will, have to get a new car. I will, uh, I will take a look at it this afternoon. Okay, that's good. That's good. We um, also have our, Santa in the house. I think we've forgotten one other guest. We have what? Another guest. We have Santa in the house. Oh, yeah, we do have where Santa. Rick, where's Santa? Right here. You're staring at him. <laughs> uh, listeners, you'll be able to see it in the photo, but uh, Rick is alter egoing Santa in this episode. Um, okay, so let's get kicked off this week. We have a few things to go through. Um, let's just start with like a couple of the bigger stories from the last week that we did not cover on last week's episode. Um, <laughs> the main one being this ring doorbell stuff. Um, so Alex, why don't you give just like a really brief rundown of what the ring doorbell stuff was about? So there were, there were a lot of reports about people gaining access to uh, people's ring cameras. And there was even discussions of a podcast type thing that was being held on a criminal forum where they would go live and, gain access to these Actually cameras and, yeah, the cameras, and heckle yeah. the people um, in their houses and have that streamed for a bunch of different people. Which was and weird because like it, at first you think it's kind of funny, but then like some of the videos started coming out and it was like... They were messing with, with children yeah. and it overall not really a good thing. But uh, Ring has come out and they've confirmed that there wasn't any kind of compromise on their end. So to me, that makes me think that it's more of a something on the on the end user side. So whether like, that's no multi-factor authentication, and we all know how important that is, or a password reuse, or open ports. Right. I think I think it's more likely that like it's a lack of authentication measures. Yeah. Uh, like you know, like password reuse, like you say, or just weak passwords, weak creds. And a topic like this always <laughs> has the potential to cause a lot of scare in uh, in the mainstream audience. So people who aren't really familiar with some of the more technical sides of this. Um, yeah, I mean, is it shocking to anyone that an IoT device could be exploited for malicious purposes? Could be compromised, yeah. What are some of the basic stuff that you uh, kind of implement to, you know, prevent stuff like this from happening? Well, I'm going to back up a little bit because I think Ring made their statement and investigation extremely quickly. And they pointed to the users, their customers, um, as a CISO and as someone who's directed incident response and done incident response. That's a pretty quick turnaround for an investigation. Um, it may very well be, you know, lack of multi-factor authentication on the ring account that led to it. But I, I think a lot of IOT vendors are very quick to blame the victims when I think they need to look at themselves. Um, the average user, it's not difficult to set up multi-factor authentication in ring. Um, but the average user may not know how to do that. So why not turn multi-factor authentication on by default as part of a setup wizard, right? Well, it creates friction for the for the customer experience, which I think is why a lot of vendors don't, and it may make people complain about the products and things along those lines. So just saying it's the user's fault, uh, which is a little bit of a paraphrase, I don't think it's the right approach. I mean, you need to make scalable, transparent security that protects the users. And you can't just say, oh, you didn't set up multi-factor authentication. And it goes back to this root problem that we have with just passwords are a pain in the butt. Passwords are difficult, challenging. You know, my password manager is kind of a pain in the butt to get wider adoption in my own household. Um, so I, I appreciate some of the challenges there. But yeah, that was a pretty quick investigation to turn around and confirm that it was absolutely 100% on the users. That's exactly what we talked about earlier today, Harrison and I, um, kind of the mainstreaming of multi-factor authentication and how are some ways you can get around that while still keeping people on an easy user experience, right? right. So one thing that I suggested was opting out of multi-factor. So during setup, in. you have something that you can check to say, no, I do not wish to set it up, but by default, which most people are going to choose to do, it'll have that automatically. I mean, with a very consumer focused product like ring is right it's not like an enterprise sort of yeah. thing it's more consumery 
Um, and kind of going with the expectation that people are going to be using it on their phones, on their devices, on their computers, whatever it is. Um, I think that that is actually a kind of a perfect use case to have something like a default two-factor because you already have people who are fairly well tech savvy enough to use their phone to look at a camera that they have connected to their network. Well, this, this is just like one more step. But to your point, and that was the, that was the same point that I brought up earlier, Rick, with Alex, was the user the customer usability uh, aspect of it i think when you from a company perspective if you're launching a new product you want it to have as easy access as possible so mm -hmm. it's kind of like balancing that out on a on a large scale i think is i think Difficult. it i think it's hard but i think it, again it's not impossible and it's something that i think more companies should kind of focus on i think it also comes down to trust like when i if i buy a product from um, a company I trust that the company has put the right security protocols in place like that's not on me and that should be part of something when you're building a product like I trust that company to trust well to secure my house basically so mm -hmm. mm. yeah no I, I I kind of pretty much agree with that completely because like if you're selling something to the wide masses then I think the general expectation is that it's going to be number one properly vetted to be secure and Number two, that it'll work properly. And I think that rings, obviously, they're super popular. Um, and I think so I think it's been proven that they work. But, like, being secure is, is a whole other thing. Um, I don't think that you can necessarily put the, the onus onto the, uh, onto the consumer yeah. to, to just completely secure all their stuff. Um, but New Orleans was a big target of ransomware, and I believe it was targeted by Ryuk, right? Mm -hmm. That was Which the conclusion. We've seen many, many times before. And it's interesting because New Orleans isn't a small town in the middle of nowhere, right? It's a mm -mm. pretty big city with a pretty decent infrastructure, right? So Yeah. I mean, it, it's reminiscent of Atlanta. Exactly. When they yeah. got hit by, mm -hmm. by ransomware. Um, but kind of drawing out the bigger trend of ransomware in general, um, I think we're kind of seeing this shift from... You know, over time, and it, it seems like it's been very quickly over the last year, two years, you know, we've seen big events happening every couple months, then it got down to like every month, every week, and now it's like almost every single day, we have another fairly significant compromise of uh, of a system by ransomware. Which is interesting, because if you think about these things that, were ha that are happening now, if you think about it about a year ago, two years ago, it would be pretty significant news, but it's like oh, city of New Orleans gets hit by ransomware, and our first thought is, oh, of course they are. You right. Know? It's going to be somebody else. I yeah. mean, you know, this week, next week. I mean, it's just, it, it's ongoing. Um, I think one of the, the other thing is that these payments continue to keep increasing keep increasing over time. Um, I think the the one from Maze, the Maze ransomware, they were asking for uh, a million. Yeah. And I think I heard also that they may have been asking for six million. And so, I mean, like, these are just... Insane amounts. So what's what's the incentive for them to stop? You know, they if they know that targeting organizations like this, they can keep getting payouts. They don't really have an incentive to to stop or to stop increasing the uh, ransom demands too. Right, um, Rick. From like a from a businessy sort of perspective um, on ransomware, I mean, how do you how do you generally plan for something like that? And do you when when do you start to factor in like paying a ransom into your risk kind of portfolio? So we talked about this last week on a client webinar that we did. So if you're a Digital Shadows client, uh, be on the lookout for a recording of that and the slides for it. But what we talked about last week was a tabletop exercise that we actually ran in Q3 here at Digital Shadows. We did a tabletop exercise on extortion. It was more broad than ransomware. It had uh, data extortion flavors, client data, employee data. Um, in the mix, but we had Alistair, our CEO, was in the mix. Uh, we had the executive team, HR, marketing, PR in the room, and we walked through an extortion scenario and how would we respond to it. And I think that's probably one of the easiest things that you can do. It, it doesn't cost money. It costs time. You can do it remote so you don't have to have people fly, and you can start asking yourself questions like, are we going to pay or not? If we did decide to pay or not, what kind of outside counsel's perspective do we need to get? Is this going to avoid any insurance policies that we have? How would we procure cryptocurrency to pay an extortion? What would our customers think if we did pay an extortion? Um, do we have 
uh, backup data that we can actually restore and recover to. And all of those things need to be done in advance. So as you're looking at your 2020 uh, tabletop exercises, uh, I would definitely put a broader extortion scenario into the mix and get some senior executive leadership um, in it. And we did it parallel. We had a round table for, I think, two hours with the, uh, the VPs across the company. And then in addition, we had a day-long exercise with the IT and security teams that was a more technical, tactical, operational focus, which was good. So the C-suite uh, got the appropriate level of interaction and questions that they needed, and they didn't get you know, conversations around types of encryption and things that they didn't care about. And then we could still do the things that we wanted to do from a practical operations perspective at the same time. And then critically, we captured our lessons learned. And there was a lot of things that we learned uh, that will help prepare us in the unfortunate event uh, that scenario occurs to us here. I think obviously this is a great exercise if you're a um, organization that's thinking about it. But in the cases that we've seen reported this year, it's often been the ones who aren't expecting it, who who don't know how to respond to these ransomware campaigns. Um, I think in the case of the city of Joburg, it had two incidents where the government had been told or the local government had been told that they had issues with their system, but it was just totally ignored. And like, we don't know the greater details here, but um, there are organizations that probably don't have this as part of their conversation in this security kind of mm-hmm. like, uh, yeah, protocol, I guess. So um, I guess, how do we make this more of a conversation um, or yeah, more of a deal? I mean, we've already had this year, a couple of US agencies and organizations reach out and say, hey, this is an issue. If you're in this sector, you need to be well aware of this. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think one of them even urged them not to pay out the ransoms, which is but, interesting to... I mean, yeah, FBI always suggests yeah. to not pay the ransom. And I mean, I understand their point of view from a law enforcement mm-hmm. perspective, but, um, you know, sometimes... People are still going to do it. I mean, yeah, people are always going to, you know, kind of just do whatever makes sense for them. But, um, you know you just kind of have it's good to have a plan in place yeah. rather than you know deciding those things in the moment like rick said you know having a tabletop doing something ahead of time having a playbook in place and the right procedures and stuff in place is is good um i wanted to also bring up the fact that uh or i guess just kind of pose a question um you know recently we saw one of the it was it was, it was like a major data center that got hit uh and then ransomware um, in 2020, do we think that like there's going to be more things like that where threat actors are going to be trying to get into more centralized, um, we'll say like a cloud provider or like a data center provider or something like that, where that they can hit multiple victims at once with one ransomware attack? Um, do you think that we'll see that increasing in 2020 or, or not? I think it's, to me, we talk about barriers to entry for cyber criminals for me to target Amazon or Rackspace or whoever it may be, it's gonna they're gonna have a little bit more, not a little bit, a lot more mature security program. They're not gonna be invincible, of course. So can I, you know, spend all this time targeting one organization, or can I go against a bunch of local municipalities and get death by a thousand, you know, attempts? Um, I, I think you'll see both, but. If I was uh, planning targeting, I would go after low-hanging fruit that's going to make me more money and more opportunities. You think about total addressable market, I think the total addressable market for extortion is much larger when you go the smaller sectors that have less maturity and even less knowledge of the threat. Sure. Yeah. I guess a lot of organizations are like digitally transforming, so they are going to be moving towards the cloud. And I guess that's a trend that we'll see, you know, business operations, I guess it would be difficult to say at this stage how their act well I guess their actors will kind of um evolve to meet their the the business's needs as well so it's something that we could definitely see from my perspective yeah yeah that makes sense moving yeah moving to a more um the digital transformation as everybody likes to call it the buzzword of of business um does bring with it a lot of exposed you know things whether that's data whether that's you know, exposed hardware, whether that's shadow IT, whatever it might be. Um, I think that digital transformation brings a lot of that with it. Um, And I think in some cases, it's not even threat actors trying to be really sophisticated. It's where you have organizations that accidentally expose something and 
that is just something that criminals can take advantage of very easily. So um, it could be a bit opportunistic. It could just be accidental. Oh, I've come across this. Like it could, yeah, be a bit of both, I guess. Yeah. All right. So, I mean, I kind of touched on it there for just a second, but um, let's talk about data breaches, data leakage over the last year and kind of what we think for 2020. Um, we were talking about it before the before we started recording, but Rick, there were some pretty major data breaches, uh, data leaks from 2019, Capital One being one, uh, the Marriott breach being another. Um, you know, how, how does, uh, in, in, my, in my opinion, I feel like it's gotten to the point where we're so saturated with, with media reports of, you know, another company has been breached, another company has leaked millions of records or whatever it might be. Um, how do you think that that trend is going to continue into the new year? Yeah, what used to be top of the fold news to use a newspaper analogy is kind of back page these days i think about marriott in particular um the ico in the uk came out with the fine in the summer announced a hundred million pound fine i believe is what it was um, and i was doing some research before the show and it's still in litigation naturally marriott came out and said hey we we don't agree with this and they were going to fight it there, but nothing has happened. So you would see a lot of headlines that would say Marriott's been fine, but really they haven't. It's going to be a very long tail of litigation that's there. So I think there was some initial, I don't know if excitement's the right word, but finally you saw GDPR enforcement within the UK. Uh, it wasn't the first example, but a significant example. Um, but now as it's gone on, you know, where are those fines? Where's the accountability? Um, it, it, it may minimize um, some of the concerns that came up around GDPR and privacy and make people less inclined to care about it if you're uh, in, in an enterprise that's trying to protect customer data. So I think it'll be business as usual in 2020. The stuff will continue. I'll still have free credit reporting uh, for all of next year. I, in fact, it probably will be getting to my 2021 uh, credit reporting. So I think it's up to us as individuals to do things like enable multi-factor authentication on our IoT devices, to use unique passwords um, because we can't really rely on the vendors that provide us products uh, to keep our data safe. So you, you mentioned GDPR, you know, I mean, we talked about it a little bit last week, but uh, California passed their uh, data privacy act regulation, whatever you want to call it, the CCPA. Um, I think we'll see some stuff that comes out of that. I think that they're, you know, it comes into effect in the new year. Um, we'll see some, fallout from that just like we did from gdpr we kind of had to wait and see what actually would be mm -hmm. kind of implemented and where uh, regulators would go with it um but i think in my opinion at least i think in 2020 we might see some more states some more local um you know kind of acts go into place or at least be voted on come up in come up in legislation and stuff like that um what do y'all think about that? Do you think that there'll be more, and I'm, I'm sort of excluding Vic from this since y'all already have GDPR, but like in the States, um, you know, there's always been, since GDPR has been talked about, there's always been this discussion of, well, should the US do a GDPR type thing for the, for the entire country? Um, where do we think that that landscape will go in the new year? I have a high confidence assessment that there will absolutely be zero federal level GDPR uh, legislation passed in the United States since they cannot agree on anything at all. <laughs> That's fair. That's yeah. Fair. I mean, like to Rick's point, it's, it's difficult because you have 50 different states, each with their own set of laws, which mm -hmm. can make it difficult to have something being implemented on a federal level. But I think that having these different regulations pop up in individual states might promote it and maybe other states will begin to see, okay, hey, maybe how can we implement this? Because we've seen what? Is it California and New York? I think it's New York. Yeah, I think we talked about that last week yeah. as well. So um, I think we'll definitely see maybe a couple more discussions in different states. But yeah, on, on a mean, federal California level. California is a huge state. It's obviously. significant. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's a it's a big thing for, for data. Kind of like a domino effect. Yeah, and I, <laughs> it just popped into my head. And maybe this isn't the perfect analogy. But if you think of like the legalization of marijuana and yeah. decriminalization across the states, I mean, that's happened, that's hap it's happened fairly rapidly over the last It was slow year, to, very years. slow to start with only a couple, but then after it's, that, it's like multiple yeah, at the same yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? And, and, and I'm not, you know, whether or not you have different thoughts on, you know, whether that should be, you know, legalized or whatever. Um, Digital Shadows does not promote the illegal <laughs> use of marijuana. <laughs> but, I mean, I think something like that, 
you know, a domino effect is yeah. is something that could happen over the next year, two years, three years, um, which I think would be good. I think it'd mm-hmm. be a good thing overall to have some legal frameworks in place to yeah. kind of uh, curtail some of the exposure. It would make defenders' lives easier if, if we just had a federal one policy or one set of guidelines across the country instead of having to worry about a, a bunch of disparate ones across the nation. Yeah, definitely. All right. So let's wrap up this week's episode with a few questions to end the year on a, on a, on a good note, on a happy note. Um, although this first one is probably not a very happy note, but okay, just quick question, uh, quick answers off the top of your head. Will we see a major ransomware compromise in 2020 on the scale of WannaCry or not pet yet? No. 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 Uh, okay, will we see the resurgence of the Dark Overlord? Yes. Yes. Other yes. guests? A little bit of a spicy. You can't just keep copying me. <laughs> Rick, what do you think? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, less security <laughs> questions. Uh, what is your favorite Christmas movie? Elf. It's a good one. Die Hard. Okay, solid. I can't think of them. You don't know any Christmas movies? Not like my favorite. But oh, Home Alone. Home Alone. I don't think I've ever seen Home Alone. Oh my gosh. Have you seen Elf? Muppets Christmas Story. Muppets Christmas. I have not seen that one. I think Star Wars is a legit Christmas movie. It's a Christmas in, in spirit. Like Christmas season, Star Wars is in play. Yeah, if you want to have a bad Christmas by watching the new Star Wars movie. Whoa, whoa. There's a segue into the last question. That's, that's, hold that thought for my last question. Uh, all right. What's the worst Christmas present that you've ever received? I received a stressful once. Was that somebody trying to tell you that you're too stressed out? <laughs> <laughs> so mean. Okay, what's the best Christmas present you've ever best received? Best Christmas I've ever present I've ever received must have been when I was a little kid and I got a Game Boy Advance. Oh, I nerd. did with a Jurassic Park <laughs> game on it that terrified me so much that I had to get my parents to uh, return it and on get, the Game Boy. Yep, and get me a Jimmy Neutron game. Oh. More, more tame for you. <laughs> That's good. All right, Rick, best or worst Christmas present? It's more like a theme. When I was growing up, my uncle used, and my dad would get each other's kids very loud gifts to just annoy the other one's parents. And so they were good for me, but I'm sure every single gift I got from my uncle drove my dad crazy. Okay. <laughs> Will Shadow Talk reach 100,000 downloads in 2020? Yes. Please. Of course. <laughs> Rick, you took too long to answer that one. 50,000 of those downloads are going to be me. Mm-hmm. So this all counts, right? Yeah. 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 It's all about the numbers. Okay. Last question. Will Rise of Skywalker be good? No. No comment. Yes. I think yes. Therefore, I am the tie-breaking, <laughs> and, and that means that it will be good. All right, so that will do it for us for this year for Shadow Talk. Um, Thank you, guests. Thank you, listeners. Remember to give us the greatest gift for Christmas and rate us on iTunes. Uh, Subscribe to our threat intelligence updates at resources.digitalshadows.com for 2020. And uh, check out our blog, which will be live uh, this week, which will be all about forecasting uh, by very own Alex. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's his blog. So yeah, so thank y'all for joining and talk to y'all next year. Ciao. Bye, Merry Christmas.